Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of A Clergyman's Daughter by George Orwell. So this is some of his non-fiction. As usual, I'm going to read you the blurb, and then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then share my overall thoughts and a rating at the end. What's good about this is that it investigates, like, working class life in, uh, you know, 1932 or whenever it was written. When was it published? 1935, so it probably was written in 1932. Uh, here's the blurb. A loss of memory drives Dorothy, one of England's old maids, from her drab life as the rector's daughter onto the streets of London, to the hop gardens of Kent and the grimness of a fourth-rate private school, only to return at last to the smallness of her life at home. Here, George Orwell affects one of his earliest pieces of social reportage, as with devastating accuracy he depicts the hypocrisy, the poverty, and the spiritual starvation which accompanied Dorothy on her odyssey through the England of the 30s. So I thought this was a great opening line. As the alarm clock on the chest of drawers exploded like a horrid little bomb of bell metal, Dorothy, wrenched from the depths of some complex, troubling dream, awoke with a start and lay on her back, looking into the darkness in extreme exhaustion. Although then he does say the alarm clock continued its nagging feminine clamour. And, um, yeah, I don't know, a bit sexist. <laughs> I thought this was very quite amusing. So this church is talking about putting on a play, and they say, um, I do wish we'd chosen something a bit easier. The arm, the armour is a dreadful job to make, and I'm afraid the jackboots are going to be worse. I think next time you must really have a Roman or Greek play. Something where they only have to wear togas. We have a baby that's turning black, and it's had the diarrhoea something cruel. And then the reverend, with um, lots of compassion, turns around and says, uh, Must I have these disgusting details while I'm eating my breakfast? And uh, the rector has a go at his daughter he said, because she calls something dinner. And he says, Luncheon, Dorothy, luncheon. I do wish you would drop that abominable lower class habit of calling the midday meal dinner. My granddad used to have a go at people for things like that as well. Well, he was an English teacher, so fair play to him. This, this line made me chuckle. The best brothel scenes in literature have been written, without exception, by pious believers or pious unbelievers. Quote here, there's quite enough evil in the world without going about looking for it. Uh, some, one of the days gets described as, it was the kind of day that is called glorious by people who don't have to work. Another quote here, one of the characters says, Ah, miss, it's a weary world we lives in, ain't it, miss? A weary, sinful world. One of the women's talking about men here, and she says, But why couldn't they leave you alone? Why did they always have to kiss you and maul you about? They were dreadful when they kissed you, dreadful and a little disgusting, like some large furry beast that rubs itself against you, all too friendly and yet liable to turn dangerous at any moment. So some things have not changed. <laughs> these gypsies here, I'm sure that's not the, the, the done term these days, but I like this little exchange here. What is it that the cleverest man in England couldn't do? I don't know, what? Tickle a gnat's ass with a telegraph pole. Okay, somebody... Um is singing to the tune of Deutschland, Deutschland über all. Uh, keep the Aspidistra flying, which is the title of another George Orwell book. And so Dorothy ends up going to teach at this school. And there are a few bits, a few little jokes about French, which made me laugh as I'm still studying it. And again, because this is at a sort of private girls' school. So I think this is funny because it shows you how these things were run. And by necessity, you know, they had to run like this. Capitalism. Well, the parents of that lot are what I call the good payers. You know what I mean by that? They're the ones that pay cash on the nail and no jibbing at an extra half guinea or so now and again. You're not to smack any of that lot, not on any account. This lot over here are the medium payers. Their parents do pay up sooner or later, but you don't get the money out of them without you worry them for it night and day. You can smack that lot if they get saucy, but don't go and leave a mark their parents can see. If you'll take my advice, the best thing with children is to twist their ears. Have you ever tried that? It was a different time, and I want to read this little paragraph out here. This is um, when she, when this teacher discovers the ignorance of the class, um, because basically they're being taught what their parents think they should be taught, rather than what they should actually be taught for a good education. This line does make me laugh though, this first laugh, because I feel like you can forgive this of children. For they know nothing, absolutely nothing, 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 nothing like the Dadaists. It was, I don't even know how to say that. It was appalling that even children could be so ignorant. There were only two girls in the class who knew whether the earth went round the sun or the sun round the earth. And not a single one of them could tell Dorothy who was the last king before George V, or who wrote Hamlet, or what was meant by a vulgar fraction, or which ocean you crossed to get to America, the Atlantic or the Pacific. And the big girls of 15 were not much better than the tiny infants of eight, except that the former could at least read consecutively and write neat copper plate. That was the one thing that nearly all of the older girls could do. They could write neatly. Mrs. Creevy had seen to that. And of course, here and there, in the midst of their ignorance, there were small disconnected islets of knowledge. 
for example some odd stanzas from pieces of poetry that they had learned by heart and a few Ollendorfian French sentences such as Passez-moi le beurre s'il vous plaît and Le fils du jardinier a perdu son chapeau which they appeared to have learned as a parrot learns pretty pole. As for their arithmetic, it was a little better than the other subjects. Most of them knew how to add and subtract, about half of them had some notion of how to multiply and there were even three or four who had struggled as far as long division. But that was the utmost limit of their knowledge and beyond in every direction lay utter impenetrable night. And then she basically gets told off by her, by her boss for um, teaching them proper lessons. So the boss says, don't go filling them up with a lot of grammar and syntax and verbs and all that. That kind of stuff doesn't get them anywhere so far as I can see. Give them a bit of parlez-vous fancy and passez-moi le beur and so forth. There's a lot more use than grammar. And then there's Latin. I always put Latin on the prospectus. But I don't suppose you're very great on Latin, are you? No, admitted Dorothy. Well, it doesn't matter. You won't have to teach it. None of our parents want their children to waste time over Latin. But they like to see it on the prospectus. It looks classy. So again, Orwell uh, reflecting the society he lives in very well again there. And so Mrs. Creevy, who's the boss, she's talking here about the religion of um, the characters. And she goes, uh, I've just been wondering what place of worship you ought to go to, she said. I suppose you were brought up C of E, weren't you? Yes, said Dorothy. Hmm, well, I can't quite make up my mind where to send you. There's St. George's, that's the C of E. And there's this Baptist chapel where I go myself. Most of our parents are nonconformists, and I don't know as they'd quite approve of a C of E teacher. You can't be too careful with the parents. They had a bit of a scare two years ago when it turned out that the teacher I had then was actually a Roman Catholic, if you please. Of course, she kept it dark as long as she could, but it came out in the end, and three of the parents took their children away. I got rid of her the same day as I found it out, naturally. Dorothy was silent. Still, went on Mrs. Creevy, we've got three C of E pupils, and I don't know as the church connection mightn't be worked up a bit, so perhaps you'd better risk it and go to St. George's. But you want to be a bit careful, you know. I'm told St. George's is one of those churches where they go in for a lot of bowing and scraping and crossing yourself and all that. We've got two parents that are Plymouth brothers and they'd throw a fit if they'd heard you've been crossing yourself. So don't go and do that, whatever you do. Very complicated, this religious malarkey. Another great quote. Children are so blind, so selfish, so merciless. They do not know when they are tormenting you past bearing. And if they did know, they would not care. So this was funny because this is obviously an observation of something that happens to all of us. Dorothy wrote the reports under Mrs. Creevy's dictation and she had to write excellent so many times that, as sometimes happens when you write a word over and over again, she forgot how to spell it and began writing it excellent, 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 excellent. I'm, I'm not gonna spell out each of the different ways she did it. I thought this was interesting because we've all been in a place like this ourselves, uh, I, I, I think. It surprised and rather shocked her to realise how little he had been in her thoughts during the past four months. There had been periods of weeks at a time when she had forgotten his existence, but the truth was that the mere business of keeping body and soul together had left her with no leisure for other emotions. Sometimes that's all you can do, you just gotta try and hold on, you know? And then there's this kind of great example of the guilt that some people get with religion, you know? Perhaps it's better, less selfish, to pretend one believes even when one doesn't, than to say openly that one's an unbeliever and perhaps help turn other people into unbelievers too. It's crazy, like, that's how powerful a grip of, over your mind that religion can get, can get. But yeah, overall, obviously I think Orwell did a great job of highlighting a lot of social issues here. The fact that I wasn't even sure whether it was fiction or non-fiction says a lot about it, really. Um, because it does just a great job of holding up the, a mirror to, to our world, and particularly the society of the 1930s during the time he was writing. So overall, I did really enjoy this book, and I would give it a pretty solid... 4 out of 5. There we have it, that's what I thought of A Clergyman's Daughter by George Orwell. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot, bye bye.